Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that diligently, that delighted greatly in his commands. Verse 2. His seed shall be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Read verse 3 together. One more time. Go ahead and personalize it. One to read. One more time. Psalm 35 verse 27. Psalm 35 verse 27. Yes Lord, we hear your word tonight. Psalm 35 verse 27. Are you there? Go ahead and read. One to read. the Lord be magnified which hath pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Let them continually shout for joy and let them say let him be magnified. The Lord who had prosperity who had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. We're going to go straight to the point I have I've struggled through the week to try to make this series as rich as possible and as straightforward as possible, as direct as possible. I've spent a major part of my life studying the subject of success, the subject of wealth and prosperity, aside from my primary assignment. I have studied hundreds of people, millionaires, billionaires, both in the kingdom and outside the kingdom. I have read countless books. I have listened to videos in an attempt to simplify this mysticism around success, especially financial prosperity. A subject that is secretly admired by so many. A subject that has remained a mystery to so many, especially in the body of Christ. A subject that many have neglected to their detriment. A subject that has destroyed others. Very mysterious subject. Every time you talk about money in the body of Christ, you attract all kinds of reactions. You attract self-centered reactions from people who think the idea of God to bless them is just to lavish money carelessly or you face a wall of religious resistance. All kinds of reactions. Yet this concept of money is the key, the very key to the quality of our lives on earth and can even affect your eternity. Hallelujah. So I'd like for us to please in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, pay attention to today's teaching and throughout this series. In the last one year of my life, I have learned more about finance and prosperity than I have all my life put together. I have discovered things that have made me cry. I have cried and said, why didn't I know this, even if it was six, seven or so years ago? When you find truth, and it is really true, you will rejoice. It will gladden your heart. Are you getting what I'm saying? So I want us to please pay attention. Many of us here are representing our destinies, our families, our generations. So many are dependent if I ask everyone to come up here and in one minute 
articulates to us the financial situation in our lives and our families and our territories, for many of us we will end up weeping here. Because it's easy to dress well and look nice in church. It's easy to pretend as though the subject of money is something that should not be considered. It's a deception of the enemy. Hallelujah. It's a big deception of the enemy. One of the blessings of a visionary ministry is to be able to guide and teach the people that God has committed to that ministry all the precepts of the kingdom that are responsible for securing their eternal destiny and then making the most out of their lives here in the earth. Hallelujah. The church is an institution. And the primary assignment of an institution is to shape people into a form, into a fashion. The church is an institution. Any society is largely a reflection of the church in that territory. Hallelujah. That's why every revival and everywhere the church and the gospel has been embraced, civilization also came with it. Praise the Lord. And so it's important for us to listen, to pay attention. Hallelujah. The Bible tells us that God is interested in our prosperity. And this is not the first time we are holding a series on prosperity. We do this every year. It's part of our building process. I do not believe in the kind of Christianity that makes someone heaven bound, um, anointed, but poor and broke. Because like the anointing, prosperity is part of the tools that will be responsible for building the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to go into too much of the things that we have covered in the last session. There, is, there are teachings on the economic system of the kingdom. There are teachings on um, financial dominion. The last series we had last year. And I don't want to repeat myself because these things are captured. So we are going to... Um, I will just do a quick recap because I have a lot to talk about. We want to delve into another paradigm in this series. I wouldn't want to repeat the same thing. In the last series, we took out time to explain, define a lot of terminologies. If you've not listened to Financial Dominion, part 1 to 4, please, please listen to it. Hallelujah. The foundation, the building block to what I'll be sharing. So I'm comfortable to share and take it from here, assuming that at least many of us still have the understanding that we got from the last financial series. Although I'll do a bit of um, a recap. Hallelujah. In the last series we talked about the concept of prosperity. How that the word prosper means to do well. Just a quick recap. And I taught us that there are four levels or five levels also of prosperity. Hallelujah. Number one is spiritual prosperity. Your eternal salvation. Your relationship with Jesus Christ. Number two, mental prosperity, the state of your wellness, your mental um, state of productivity. Number three, your health. I told you that health is wealth, your bodily prosperity. Number four, your financial prosperity now, um, the subject of abundance and financial freedom and so on and so forth. And then number five is your relational prosperity, the prosperity of your relationship with your fellow people. And we said that as a believer or in the kingdom, these five areas must be complete in your life for you to be called prosperous. Meaning if you have money and no relationships, both with Jesus and with men, something is wrong, you are not prosperous. Hallelujah. Very, very important. So, um, we took our time to explain in the last series again on the concept of poverty. I will still define that. We spoke about a few terminologies, poverty, prosperity, and so on and so forth. And we examined a few statistics. We examined a few things about poverty. I shared with us on the spiritual laws of wealth. Tithing, giving. We took our time to talk extensively about the different avenues for giving, kingdom investment, profit offering, uh, so on and so forth. And then we looked at the natural laws. The gift of a man makes room for him. I spoke about the concept of value, problem solving, and so on and so forth. Um, I, I can't remember what else I spoke about, but then I think we did go that far 
But we'll be looking at another paradigm um, in this series. Praise the Lord. So let me just define a few things. I want to be very direct and I trust that God will help us in Jesus' name. Financial prosperity. What is financial prosperity exactly? Please be sure to write. Even if you don't have something to write, you can type it on your phone or your devices, whatever it is that you have. Financial prosperity means freedom from poverty. Freedom from poverty, lack, and the negative effects that come with them. Financial prosperity means freedom from lack, poverty, and the negative effects that come with them. Open bracket. Let's list out some of the negative effects. Number one, fear. Number two, insecurity. Number three, greed. Number four, self-centeredness. Number five, unrighteousness. And the list goes on and on and on. So prosperity means financial prosperity now. Talks about freedom. Total freedom from poverty, from lack, insufficiency, and the negative effects. I tell you, there are negative effects that poverty can bring to the life of a man. Hallelujah. I'll give you another definition. Financial prosperity also means having abundant financial supplies. Having abundant financial supplies. Alongside the means to replenish, multiply, and sustain its availability. Having abundant financial supplies alongside the means to replenish, multiply, and sustain its availability. To have financial supplies is not enough. There must be in you the ability to replenish, to multiply, and to sustain that supply. At that point, you are financially prosperous. Hallelujah. Are we blessed? Number two, let's define poverty. These are the two major words that we're dealing with. One is our friend, the other is our enemy. So let's define both of them. What is poverty? Poverty is a perpetual state of lack and insufficiency of financial resources. Poverty is the perpetual state of lack an insufficiency of financial resources often characterized by lack of productivity. A perpetual state of lack and insufficiency of financial resources often characterized by lack of productivity. If you have that down, say Amen. It's important for us to understand exactly what we are talking about so that we are not lost in assumption as to what exactly we are talking about. It is the will of God for every single one of us seated here to come to a point in our lives where we have abundance of financial supplies alongside the capacity to replenish, to multiply, and to sustain its availability. Hallelujah. Now the church. Let me start by saying this. The church has largely. Or greatly suffered from what I call the incomplete teaching. On wealth and prosperity. One of the biggest tragedies of the church today financially speaking, is that most preachers do not have financial literacy. And I told you the church is an institution. An institution is any platform that permits the transference of knowledge. 
Institution is necessary for development, for productivity in any society. There are governmental institutions. There are security institutions. Right? And so on and so forth. The church as an assembly, the gathering, the congregation of people is also an institution. Both a spiritual institution and an institution in terms of education and impartation of knowledge. So most of the mindset that people have had about finances, especially in the continent of Africa and Nigeria, has come directly from men of God. Because most people do not read books, they don't attend seminars, they have no passion and appetite for knowledge in terms of financial intelligence. So their principal channel of communication, aside from education that gives them degrees and certificates, you are only in school for five years, but you are in the church for the rest of your life. Is that true? And so the church is a stronger institution that communicates knowledge. So the, the, the lack of financial knowledge and intelligence and literacy that we have is a direct reflection of the men of God that are upon our pulpit. Many men of God are anointed. Many men of God are sincere. Many men of God are genuine. They love God with all their heart. Many men of God are rich. They are wealthy. But very few have financial literacy. Is God helping us? And that lack of financial literacy has created all kinds of lopsided teachings about prosperity. So, different men of God have their views, which is a product of their experiences. How they became blessed is how they will teach you. Is that not true? And many of the ways that, they, that the men of God are blessed by can only bless a man if he is a preacher. If you are not a preacher, you cannot be blessed by the methods they teach. And we will see that in the course of the series. Are we getting blessed? And so we have a congregation that is largely aware of just one side of the requirement for true and lasting financial prosperity. Men of God have written all kinds of books about their perspectives and we must take our time to appreciate the contributions that they have made. It is only what you have that you can give. Is that not true? But then the Bible says a good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. In other words, if I love my sheep so much or God's sheep has committed to me, I must go out of my way for their sake beyond my experience to find out what is really required for them to prosper. It's called passion. It's called the heart of a pastor. The heart of a shepherd. It is selfish and self-centered when a man of God comes around his perspective about wealth and advocates that perspective alone to people. And the result of that lopsided teaching is that only one person is getting blessed. The person who is doing the teaching. And those who are passionately receiving and swallowing up everything he's advocating, hook, line, and sinker, find out that they are doing their very best, but they don't seem to connect to this key. And tonight, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I trust that God will bring a perspective for us that can make every one of us seated here who is truly interested to be blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ. The result of the lopsided financial teachings that have come in the church, the result is lost. Greed, impatience, materialism and carnality. You see that? This is the result. The resultant effect of the lopsided teachings we have brought to the body of Christ about prosperity is what has produced lost in people. And so, you have a congregation that is so passionate about money, everything about their life is money. If it's not money, if you cannot show me the financial component of what you are doing, I'm not interested. So we have a church that is hungry and desperate for money anyhow. Whether by stealing, whether by defrauding people, no matter what it is, they want to be passionate because of the nature and the type of the teaching. 
Hallelujah. We have taught people that they are not blessed because they do not have faith. We have taught all kinds of imbalanced teachings that have come. Popular. But many of them do not hold water. Listen, let me tell you something. If you listen to what I'm teaching you tonight, I give you a guarantee you will be blessed. It's a guarantee. Hallelujah. We see a lot of impatience. For instance, there are many young people in many churches who will see a jeep parked outside. And immediately after the service will go and snap it, lay hands on it, claim it, and do all of that. How many young people in churches are looting, cheating people, saving money just to buy a jeep to prove that this prosperity thing is working? To prove that they are carrying a prosperity anointing. Is that true? A young man who earns just 50,000. You see him living in a house of 750,000 because of the pressure. As advocated by his man of God. To prove that the word is working. Is that true? Impatience. Many people have compromised on the law of process. Because of the teachings. The men of God come and advocate a sharp, sharp prosperity message. Right? A message that if you can connect to immediately, tomorrow your life can change. And there will be testimonies of people that have received that kind of result. And everybody is passionate and they have no appetite for true knowledge. They do not have the staying power and the discipline to learn the principles and the protocol to the wealthy place. And so that loss is there. Everybody is moving around. Oh God, I will serve you. So that somebody from nowhere will just bless me and change my story. It has been the basis for our many unscriptural prayers. Hallelujah. Statistically speaking, um, I wanted to play a little documentary for us, but I thought it would waste time. So maybe next week if we have time. Hallelujah. Wow, there's a lot going on here. Can you help me, guys? Can we push this a little back? So that it can save me a lot of stress from this. Praise the Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Did you know that statistically speaking, about 20% of the wealthiest people in the world control 80% of the entire wealth in the world. In fact, just seven, seven of the world's wealthiest people have the wealth that is equivalent to two-thirds. Two-thirds of the entire world's wealth is controlled by seven people. Why is this so? Hallelujah. In Nigeria, for instance, there are many people who cannot live off, statistically speaking, one dollar. That's the poverty bench. That means there are people who cannot afford 150 to 200 naira per day to live on. Many of these people go to churches every Sunday, two or four. Many of these people are taught by preachers that our God is a loving God. Since I was born, I was, now I am older. Brother, have you seen? You have seen it. Keep quiet. You have seen it. I'm not insulting the song. I'm just showing us the part of the song where we are telling lies. And many people dance and sweat their lives out and go back to the secret place and say, God, what is wrong? Who is lying here? You or my pastor or me? There is a lie somewhere in this equation. Somebody is not telling the truth. Hallelujah. How many angry church members do we have in Nigeria who have done everything they have been told to do over decades and nothing has happened? And the best spiritual explanation to save both the man of God and his integrity is the victim does not have faith. Praise the Lord. 
Is that really it? Is that re- How could God, who delights in the prosperity of his servant, make the subject of wealth and prosperity so mystical? Does that look like the God you serve? Hallelujah. The subject of wealth and prosperity, the the mysticism around it is so much that every time you mention it, all that comes to people's mind is the pain of their past or their current situation. There's nothing joyful they think about money. You mention money or anything that looks like wealth and prosperity and you see this air of anger and pain that comes as a result of frustration. So people just prefer to let it lie low there. Or come to church and we keep telling our lies as usual. When the Lord brings a word like this, the Bible says he sent a word to Jacob, but it lighted upon Israel. When the Lord brings a word like this to you, it's because of what you represent. Is because of many in your house that are waiting passionately and desperately. Poverty has done more harm, brothers and sisters. More than we can ever imagine. Our ladies have gotten into prostitution because of poverty. Many people have married the wrong men because of poverty. Your mother has given you a direct, unambiguous warning about bringing a prosperous man. As a succor to their decades of untold hardship. So you, are, you represent the investment of the family. They have warned you. They started doing it indirectly. But now that you are of age, they are very direct about it. So every time a brother approaches you, you look at him in the lens of the warning you receive. And say, brother, no. It's not like you are not born again, but you don't represent the hunger of my family. Is that true? How many young men in Nigeria... Do you know, I, I, I like looking at statistics a lot because I like working based on facts. Are you aware, oh graduate, or oh prospective graduate, that only one out of every ten or more now graduates ever find any decent and meaningful job within the first five years of their graduation? In Nigeria, North America. That means it's one thing to go to school. Pay the price. This is what you would have really worked on. It will affect the camera. It's better for us to have peace. Please. Please, please, please. It's their time. They are part of the meeting. And there's nothing we can do. There is no system of driving them aside from offering this. So I would appreciate it if you can... Just do something about it. It will affect your coverage. Please snap, snap. Ah, okay. I see. Maybe next week I will stand outside. That's just the safest point. Praise God. Okay, let's continue. There's no sacrifice that is too great. Not this. This is, this is what many homes have as default. So there's nothing to run around. I mean, this is what floats around many poor homes. Is that not true? Not your home. I mean many poor homes. <sighs> Blessed be the name of the Lord. So many graduates finish from Nigeria and when they come out of the university, they are happy. They serve. And then they go to Uncle A or B. And say, Uncle, I'm now a graduate. And he says, so what about it? And then they are shocked. Right? And at first, they still believe the world is working. I'm forcing it to work. One year, nothing works. Two years, nothing works. Three years, nothing works. And then it dawns on them that that thing I've been hearing is real. Praise the Lord. So what exactly is the problem? The first topic we'll be considering tonight is why are so many people poor? Don't worry, don't worry. There's nothing we can do about it. We just manage. But I really believe something can be done. Why is this? Why are they here? Why not there? Praise the Lord. 
Why are there so many poor people? Is it a cause? Is it, is it something that should be? Did God design it that way? If no, what is wrong? I want to give you a few reasons. All of them, all of the reasons I'm about to give you will surprise you. Some of them are deceptfully simple that you may tend to ignore it. But please, I want you to write it and just let me talk to you. Are we blessed? Are we following, please? Number one. Why are so many people poor? Number one. Ready for this? They are poor because they have not decided to be wealthy. Many people are poor and will remain poor. Please underline the word decided because they have not decided to be wealthy. Now this will shock you. Just hang on until I explain it. Many well-meaning people in Nigeria are poor. And some of us seated right here have been extreme victims of poverty and lack and insufficiency because we have not decided to be wealthy. Number two, why are so many people poor? In fact, you can even put in bracket, why are so many Christians poor? Because it's, it's understandable if, if people are generally poor, there are demons around, there are all kinds of things around, but why are Christians, tongue-talking Christians, tight paying Christians, faithful Christians, why are we poor? Number two, many are poor because they do not have a goal to be wealthy. Hmm. They do not have a goal to be wealthy. Underline the word goal. Many are poor because they do not have a goal to be wealthy. Number three, why are so many people poor? Many are poor. This is a major reason now. Many are poor. You can bring that lady here. She can come and sit here, please. Those people who are having issues, you can come and sit here. There's, there's just endure people. There's, there's only so much we can do about it. Sorry about it. Number three, are you there? Lack of understanding the real formula for wealth and abundance. Right real formula for wealth and abundance in capital letter. The third reason why so many people are poor is because of the lack of of the understanding of the real formula. They have all kinds of things they call formulas, but the real formula for wealth and abundance. Lack of understanding of the real formula. The biggest of all reasons why people are poor, number four, the biggest of them all is lack of the mental transition from the realm of poverty to wealth and abundance. Oh, listen to me. Listen to what I'm about to teach you. Please. Lack of the mental transition, underline the word mental transition, from the realm of poverty to wealth. These are the four major reasons, brothers and sisters. Look up, please. These are the four major reasons why our parents, our loved ones, our churches, our preachers, myself, you, and all the people that have suffered poverty. This is the reason why many are poor today and why they will continue to be poor. They have not decided to be wealthy. They have not set it as a goal to be wealthy. They do not even understand that wealth has a formula. They surround the subject of wealth and prosperity with a lot of mysticism. And they hope that their spirituality will somehow find its way into making them blessed. No, sir. All of us today in this place 
are dressed with clothes because there is a formula. Is that not true? There is a formula for wearing trousers. You don't carry a trouser and wear it from your head down. No. The design does not permit that. Is that true? Every gentleman here, every lady, everybody here on trousers knows that there is a formula for wearing trousers. Whether you have one hand or one leg is irrelevant. You just need to just tweak the formula a little but It is the same formula. It will start down and you will put your feet and lift the trousers up. The same way you, you put on your shirt. Is that not true? There is a formula for putting on watch. Nobody ties watch around his head. Out of confusion. No, except if it's just for all these carnivals and the rest that people do. But no sane person in society would do that. They use either their left or right hand, but there is a way to go about it. Is that true? Are you getting me? There is a formula for picking and answering your call. Is that true? It doesn't matter what kind of phone. From 3310 to the one they made today, the formula is similar. Are you getting me now? There is a formula with which a woman uses to give birth to a child. Occasionally, she may have to go through CS, but there is a formula. There is a formula to which everyone eats. Food passes through the mouth. Is that true? Even if for any reason you have to use pipes because the person is, is sick and cannot swallow or something is wrong with the person, it is still just an adjustment to the same formula. Please, are we, are we getting what I'm saying? The reason why everybody wears clothes on earth is because there is a formula to do it. And everyone knows. It's simple enough. Are you getting me? By the time you put a lot of mysticism around clothes, imagine someone coming in right now and he put his clothes and didn't know how to put it well. Right? Where the neck would be is where he put the hand and just patched it anyhow and said, nobody taught me. The reason why you are smart and decently seated is because subconsciously you have known the formula for dressing. If I ask you to walk now, everybody that has two legs and can walk, aside from people who are sick, walk with a formula. Is that not true? Pastor Femi, come. Which step did you take, left or right? Which was the first step? You do not even know. That's how much you have mastered the formula for walking. Are you getting me? I simply asked you to come. And you didn't use your head to start coming. You know that you take on your... Are you getting me now? Walking is predictable because there is a formula. Is God speaking to us, please? Is God speaking to us? Bless you. Every time the law governing an operation is not known, mysticism, mysticism, is the result. Whenever we do not understand a lot of things, we tie so much mysticism in it. There are so many people that tie a lot of mysticism to the operation of the anointing. Because either they do not operate like that or they just operate at a basic level. But the more you grow into the anointing, you know that as have hazard as the operation of the spirit and the anointing is, there are exact spiritual laws. Is that true? So it is with wealth, brothers and sisters. Please write it and tie it. There is a formula. A formula that is beyond gender. A formula that is beyond race. A formula that is beyond background. A formula that is beyond educational qualification. If it is true that anything predictable in life is because it has a formula, I announce to you that if you do not know the formula that governs wealth, you will never is sustainably wealthy. There's no point arguing it. And then number four, mental transition. I'm just recapping on what I just said. Mental transition. Mental transition. The next thing I want to talk about, please write it down. The myths and mindsets that cheap people poor. Myths. M-Y-T-H-S. And the mindset, there are ideologies, there are cliches, there are alibis, there are sayings that people have embraced, believed, that have kept them poor. They have kept territories poor. 
They have kept churches poor. They have kept businesses poor. They have kept families poor and will continue to keep them poor. I want to identify a few of them. Is God helping us tonight? Number one, meet number one is that money and abundance is carnal, evil, or unnecessary. The first meat and mindset that keeps people poor and will keep them poor forever. And they support it with the scripture of 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 10. Media help us very fast. Let's see how far. Oh beautiful. God bless you for this lovely work you are doing so that everybody can follow no matter what your brain capacity is, this is simple enough for you to follow. So we expect that we should ride at the same pace, please. Praise the Lord. That money and abundance is carnal, evil, or necessary. Some of you seated here, inside and outside, looking at me. And many who are following us online and many who will be listening. That, that stumbling block is one of the things that has stopped us from even paying attention to the subject of wealth. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. He says, For the love of money huh, is the root of all evil. He says, For the love of money is what? The root of all evil. While, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through many sorrows. Now, many preachers have taken this scripture and twisted it and made it look like every time there is any desire in your heart to be blessed. You are carnal, you are fleshly, you are the devil. The Bible never said money is the root of all evil. It said the love. The word used here is the word eros. I've taught us here, right? Eros, an ungodly affinity, an attachment to money and finance that can lead you to losing your faith and you can Yes, yourself with needless sorrows. The Bible never, never ever, never ever says money is evil. Or money is the root of evil. The number one myth that has kept a lot of Africans and well-meaning Nigerians and well-meaning people. You talk about money, especially to those who are a bit elderly and hear their response about it. No, 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 no. no. Take the world and give me Jesus. Right? And it's supposed to be a very innocent cliche. But we need to observe what we are saying. Let me tell you. That conclusion was unconsciously drawn after repeated frustrations. Usually that's what happens. When you try and try and try and try and try and do all you know and nothing works, you safely create something that excuses you. Is that true? And oh, what a joy when you find a scripture. That can back up your frustration. That's what has happened to a lot of people. Some of us seated here right now. Myth number two. If God really wants me rich, He will make me rich. Myth number two. False beliefs that people have embraced that have kept them poor kept churches poor, kept territories poor. And their supporting scripture is Psalms 84 verse 11. I'm showing you meat, we're examining meat, mindsets, ideologies that people have embraced, that have given Satan access to whip them with poverty. If God wants me rich, he will make me rich. If I am not rich, it's because it's not the will of God. God did not plan for me to be rich. Many of our parents told us that. They whipped us as they said it. God doesn't want us rich. Us, we are... A, no, 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 no. This is the scripture. For the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will He withhold from them that walk uprightly. And that means if I love God and I'm fasting, I'm a member of Koinonia Prayer Band, I'm a member of the worship team, right? I serve God with all my heart and I do not see abundance. Based on this scripture, as twisted by many preachers, it convinces us that this is a sign from heaven that you and prosperity 
is not part of your, your lot. And you embrace it happily and satisfactorily. Most of the preachers that preach that thing, you go to their board meetings and hear them argue about their salary. You go to their board meetings and hear them argue about welfare. Right? Argue about so many things. The man who is preaching that error has his car parked outside. Immediately after the service, he's walking happily. There is chicken or turkey that has been prepared to him for him by his wife. There is prophet's offering or whatever waiting for him after the service. And the helpless congregations who have swallowed that error like a drug will begin to see its reaction in their lives. Hallelujah. Is God helping us? Myth number three. One of the most deceptive. That tithing is the one and only key to abundance. Aya. This looks common. Many of us until now, as I'm talking, you have embraced it as your master key and only key to a world of financial abundance. Let me tell you, there is no fallacy that is bigger than that. This will shock many of you. And I'm sure many people will now persecute me. That myth that tithing is the one and only key that is responsible for abundance in the life of a man. I am telling you this, hear me, is a deception from the pit of hell. That means when I come before God and I drop my tithe, I go back and I say, Lord, that is it. Where is the money? And we wait days turn to months. Months turn to years. Years turn to decades. There are people that have been tithing faithfully for decades. But it seems as though God has refused to open the heavens for them. It is not the unfaithfulness of God. It is our not understanding His ways. At the end of this teaching, you will get on your knees and worship God because you will see that He is truly a faithful God. Hallelujah. And we support it with Malachi 3.10, popular scripture. Right? Prove me now, here we say the Lord, if I will not open... The windows of heaven and pour you a blessing. The Bible never said if I will open heaven and pour you money. It said a blessing. Number one, you need to even know where the room is that the blessing is going to come. Because the Bible says that the blessing will come into a room. Where is it? The last time you checked your room, you didn't see anything there. That means you must understand God's language. Our lack of understanding has made us to embrace a lot of error. Number four. Another deceptive myth. As we are going, it gets more intense. Because this one I'm about to say affects so many of us here. Ready for it? Myth number four that keeps people poor. And if they don't change, will keep them poor forever. If I can just have a business idea and start up capital, I will be rich. How deceptive. Many of you are shocked right now. All I need to be rich. Give me capital. Give me a business idea. And I will be rich. How deceptive. I assure you. Hear me. I assure you. If this was all there was to wealth. I give you a guarantee. That over 70 to 80 percent of Nigerians would have been financially free today. Is that true? You meet an average young person. Right? Come, Ken. Meet somebody and tell him, what do you think, what can I do to you? How can I contribute to your financial life? And hear what he will tell you. Please, there is this business idea in my head. That's what he's telling you now. Uh, the last time I went somewhere, I saw pigs. They were rearing pigs and they sold one in my presence. They sold one, 12,000. It's not yesterday. I saw it. Are you getting what I'm saying now? Please, sir. Give me 100,000 and I promise you I will never disturb you again. 99.9% .9 of those people will return in frustration. I tell you the truth. Hallelujah. Look, I have tested this with people too many times. It takes more than business and capital to be prosperous. Are you seeing where we are very deceptive now? It is the same mindset that makes somebody think that getting a job will make him rich. Look at him after 10 years of working. There is nothing to show forth for it. 
if in four months, the average worker in Nigeria, if he does not collect salary for four months, he is literally poor and broke. Is that true? A worker that has been working for decades, 25 years, 15 years, 17 years, has even risen to a managerial level. No salary for as little as three or four months. That means something is wrong. Is God speaking to us? There are many of us you receive maybe pocket money or, mo or money or whatever. Some of us who are working, you receive your salary and we believe that all I need to do is to get a job. Oh God, shell, 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 chevron, NLNG, CBM. Huh? Or if I become a soldier, just anything you believe will bail you out. Let me tell you something. They say experience is the best teacher, but it must not be your experience. Why don't you find out those who are crying and see where they are walking already? And that should tell you that there must be something more. Is God helping us? There are many of us as we are seated right here. We are angry with our uncles. We are angry with our aunties because the last time you went, you just went and said, Sir, if you can give me only 20,000, all I need is 20,000. And I swear, that's how many of I swear to you, 20,000 and it's over. Don't ever give me anything again. They gave you 20,000 in three days. You didn't even start the business in the first place. You see that? You didn't even start it. Because most likely with that money you were paying somebody you were owing. Is God speaking to us, please? The fifth myth that keeps people poor and will continue to keep people poor is what I call entitlement mentality. Everybody say entitlement mentality. Now write it. Entitlement mentality. The feeling that someone somewhere is responsible for your success and prosperity. Entitlement mentality. That feeling that my prosperity is in the hands of my uncle or in the hands of my father. After all, he gave back to me. If he does not take care of me, God will punish him. The entitlement that government, I'm a citizen of Nigeria. From 18 years, they are supposed to be giving me money. Now I'm 35. Government is owing me for 18 minus 35. That number of years. Entitlement mentality. You see people carrying placards all around, loitering our streets in Nigeria, advocating a cause they will not directly benefit from because it gives them succor to pass blames. Entitlement mentality. You think one of your uncles or your friend or your pastor or your family, some of us are angry with our uncles. He's the director of of, of NMPC. What is there to just give me a job? Wicked and stupid man. You see his children, you hate them. They greet you. Good afternoon, uncle. Say the day you greet me, I wound you. You are as stupid as your father. Entitlement mentality. There are many of us, don't laugh, oh, there are many of us who hate our fathers and mothers and relatives. You look at where you are sleeping and you look at your father. And you just wish that you would do something wrong and let them arrest him. Just to ease off your pain. This mentality is one of the things that have made us to hate rich people. There is a natural inclination to resent and to hate wealthy people. Because every time you see a wealthy man, it reveals to you that something he has done is what you are looking for so desperately and passionately. And every time you see a wealthy man, that resentment. Hallelujah. Let promise or Michael or Pastor Femi come back next week here and you see a Range Rover spot parked outside. First and foremost, people will ask, now get this guy. They say, Michael, say which one? Michael, Michael, that I know. Ah. It's not everything you see that is just God that really knows what people do. Bible says envy not the wicked. You see that? 
Something about his success has brought pain to you. That's the reason why this cause, this I said, it is actually a cause. Hallelujah. It's very important. How many ladies hate others? You love them when they look like you. The day they, they did not look like you, say, uh-uh. hey, wonder shall never end. When did this lady even afford uh, this and that? I'm sure she has pinned down one man. That's always how they do. What if I'm sure God has blessed her? What if I'm sure her thinking has been straightened out and she's getting it right now? Notice, we tie a lot of negativism to wealth. You never see a man that is blessed, especially a young person. When you see somebody who is almost dying and they tell you he's rich, you know that this guy, even if he's just discipline alone, has taken him through. But you just see somebody of an average age or a young man, you just look and say, no way, something is wrong. See a lady, you see a lady. Many guys will say that, me, a man, how bad, this is an insult. This lady that I know, especially that you knew the person. You see that? Many of us have called our uncles occultists. We have ignored their sacrifices. You just know that the last time he left your house, he left with slippers. Now he came into your house with something and he blessed all of you. Immediately he leaves. Your mother, your father and your uncle sit back and they say, ah, Are you sure this guy is not into drugs or armed robbery? Why do we have to associate wealth with negativism? This is why. Because of our frustration. Secretly speaking, we admire the people we resent in the open. We admire the feats that they have accomplished. And we wonder how they were able to do it. And rather than settling down with all humility to learn the precepts, we resent them as a way of easing out our own pain. Hallelujah. Friends, listen to me. Every one of us seated right here will have to make a choice in the course of this conference. more than a meeting. It's truly a conference. Every one of us will have to make a decision whether you want to remain the way you are and keep getting angry at others who are moving using seniority to justify why you should be richer than them or using the fact that you put pampas for them or using all this this, this cultural age-long stumbling blocks that stop people from moving forward. Or you can choose and say, Lord, I'm face to face with my destiny and I'm ready to confront this. What you never confront, you will not conquer. Assumption is the least level of knowledge. If you assume you, you have your destiny, your financial destiny straightened out, you are already in error. There is a spirit that attacks the message of wealth and prosperity in the body of Christ. Now I know there are imbalances. But let me tell you, one of the strongest assaults of Satan in a congregation is when the message of wealth and prosperity is about to come. And he uses spirituality to launch that attack. The moment you begin to hear a message like this, something shuts you down. You are not teaching of prayer on the anointing or the wisdom of the spirit or levels of spiritual growth or fasting and praying or evangelism you are talking about money and you just shut down that's the devil wanting to destroy your destiny because sooner or later you'll find out that it takes more than preaching to have a successful ministry sooner or later you'll find out that it takes more than praying in tongues to raise kids is that true Every one of us here is suffering or has suffered from at least one or more of this mindset. And right now, before we continue, my job tonight is like a surgeon. There is a surgery that is about to give. I just gave you this, this um, background before I build on what we are going to talk about tonight. I want to teach you something that will change your life forever if you care to pay attention. 
I am determined. I've made my decision already. But I want to see how that God will help all of us together to come into this decision. How to be wealthy. How to be wealthy. This is how to be wealthy. I want to give you the keys. And I give you a guarantee in the name of the Lord God of heaven. That if you are childlike enough to take these things I'm telling you. You and poverty will part ways forever. It doesn't matter what the limitations are. Hallelujah. Number one. The first key to really being wealthy is to make the decision to be wealthy. Write that word down, decision. The decision to be wealthy. The decision to be wealthy. Brothers and sisters, look at me. You came to Koinonia tonight because you decided to be here, true or false. You would have been in any other place but right from morning, you had set it that you will be here. And nothing stopped you. No witch from your village appeared on the road and said, go back. Because of the power of your decision. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, there is a difference between a wish and a decision. A wish is a desire. A wish is a craving. Nothing more. Many people wish to be wealthy. You go outside and stand. Hold 1,000 naira notes or 100,000 or a million and wave it and say, who wants to have this type all his life? You will be shocked to see all kinds of people come. Embracing that message. Oh, I want to be rich. However, many people think a wish is a decision. No, sir. A decision is a strong desire. Write it down. A decision is a strong desire that is backed up by the willingness backed up by the willingness to pay the price to see that desire accomplished. That's a decision. There is a difference between a wish and a decision. Many of you think you have decided to be blessed. You have, you hate poverty. You like prosperity. But you have not decided. The very first reason. Is God speaking to us? I can prove to you. Excuse me. I can prove to you that you have not made that decision. Show me what you are doing right now in your life. To support your decision. You decided to love God. And that decision. I can see the things you are doing. I see you running away from a nightclub. That is a sacrifice to honor your decision. Is that true? I see you panting after the word of God. I see you using the money that you should buy. Shoes and clothes with. To buy an electronic device. That you can use for your spiritual growth. That is a proof that you have decided. Hallelujah. I've seen you pray and fast for three days, one week, or that one month, because you want to rise in the level of the anointing. You have decided to contend for the anointing. A decision is never a decision until there is a willingness and a readiness to accept the responsibility that will make that decision come to pass. So many have not decided to be wealthy. They want to be wealthy. Every time they hear success stories, they look and they say, ah, how did you do it? Ken, Ken, Ken. Ah, money like you. You see, all those kinds of cliches. And they turn, they say, ah, Nigeria is good for you, for some of us talk. They have not decided. How many times have you seen a very wealthy man that you have access to? And you came and sat down and bought five alive. Dropped it at the feet of the person and said, I came purposely because I want you to teach me the principles. You are wealthy. I've seen the proof. Other people just come and loiter the gate of rich people. 
with all kinds of pregnant expectations, hoping that their rent will be paid through the, that coming. And the man drags his wife and their two children as proof to the man that the, the situation is serious. And they stand in front of his gate. Uncle, it's me. Who? Uh, James. With James. Abba, why are you treating me like this? See my two children. Even if it's not for us, just for my two children. Watch this. The uncle counts 250,000. Is that not true? Gives James. What does the man tell the uncle? Thank you, foolish man. Rather than receiving the money to say, by the way, sir, sit on the floor and say, Junior, whatever, bring me a paper. I want this to be the last time I'm receiving money from you. What can I learn? They collect the money and say thank you and go and commit the same blunder they did. And by next year, they are back again. Hey, uncle, don't be angry. Oh. It's me again. And some even say, do you know it's because of me that God is blessing you? It's because you don't know the prayer I'm praying for you. Pray for yourself like that. You try to make people feel guilty because you think that you have a stake in their wealth. Are you getting what I'm saying? Some of you have very wealthy parents. And you are just hoping that you, when you get to 30 or 40, they will now call you and say, now you are a man, you have three children, this estate is for you. What sort of a dream is that? Everybody say, I decide to be wealthy. It's shocking some of you right now because you are seeing that you have never decided. You decided to get married. Some of you have made a decision, I must marry this year. You gave it a time target, you made a decision. Right now, you are on your fifth marriage book and you will truly marry because you decided to. But you won't be rich because you have not decided to. You hope you will be rich. You pray you will be rich. You wish you will be rich. You beg to be rich. You want to lambano the richness or riches. No matter what Greek and Hebrew word you speak, let me tell you the truth. If you do not know the path to wealth, you will, you will end up in bitter frustration. Hallelujah. Those in school, you are in school today because you decided to be in school. There was a time you looked at that course and you said, Kai. But something in you, it was your decision that made you to run and go and write the exam in the midst of the rain. Your umbrella was missing, but you know, 8.30, they may not allow you to enter. That decision sponsored that sacrifice. And you didn't apologize to yourself. Decisions are powerful. You preach a salvation message and you give people room and they decide, I want to give my heart to the Lord. And they prove that it's not just a wish by standing up to ignore the shame and the embarrassment. And sometimes you see people stand crying. They mean business with God. You are seated here right now because you decided to sit down. At the point you are tired of sitting, you have every right unhindered to get up and walk out of this place. Is that true? You are only seated here because of your decision. We do this in every other area. Except our finances. Because we have been taught that it will happen automatically. You must decide to be wealthy. You can decide to reject poverty. That's not the same as deciding to be wealthy. I made up my mind that I was going to be wealthy that I was going to be blessed. I took out time to make sure it was a decision that I honored. And there is nothing that would change my mind about it. Right here where you are sitting, look at me. If you decide that what you need right now is 2,000 to cure the current hunger, because of that decision, the 2,000 will come. But afterwards, you will be poor. Is that true? But you can decide. And say, I don't know the way. I don't know what to do. I'm clueless about the direction, but start with a decision. All decisions are free. You don't pay for them. That's why every man who is poor has a right to remain poor. Decisions are free. You pay for knowledge. You don't pay for decisions. 
Is God speaking to us? Decisions are absolutely free. Decisions depend on you alone. They don't depend on the cooperation of another person. So you have no excuse to say, I would have decided, but Kai, the way I saw this guy looking at me, what if I... No, 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 no. It's a personal decision. I will. I will. I release my will. I make that choice. I choose to partner with God. I choose to partner with the spirit of wisdom. Lay your hands on your head and say, I decide to be blessed. Say, I decide to end poverty. I decide to be wealthy. I may not know what to do. I may not know how to go about it. I may not know how to come out of my present situation. But I decide in the name of the Lord Jesus to be wealthy. This looks very simple. You only invite God into your financial life when you decide. The same way you invited Him into your life, spiritually speaking, when you made the decision. Behold, I stand at the door. And what? If He knocked your heart to come into your life, He will knock on the door of your finances and remain there until you decide to invite Him. You may not know what to do, brothers and sisters, but can you decide? Your father went to school. Your mother went to school. Your father got a job, but they never decided to be wealthy. They decided to get jobs, and so they got it. They decided to marry. They decided, how many children are we going to have? One said three, one had five. They voted. Majority carried the vote. You are five now. Right? Because of that decision. You decided to wear the dress that you are wearing today. No demon in your village, I say it again, Africa, no demon in your village showed up in your wardrobe and said, this one is my own. No. As you were picking the shirt, no spirit paralyzed your hand because your decisions were honored both by God and the devil. Is that true? You had a choice. We trivialize the power of decisions in our finances. And so you see a lot of people outside. This is how they talk. Kai, when will my story change? Oh God, oh God, that changes stories. That's not a decision. That's a communication of regret and frustration. It's not a decision. Oh, oh Lord, this job, if my arrears come, ah, my life will change. It's still not a decision. A decision is I have come to the end of my life. I have seen what has happened to my father and my mother. I've seen myself beg my way through life. I have seen the fierceness of society. I have seen the inevitable frustration that comes as a result of poverty. And I decide, I make up my mind that my life is not going to be this way. Brothers and sisters, you are not drinking today because you decided to. There are bars that are open. Today is Friday. True or false? There were some of you who were drinking before. Yes, the power of the Holy Spirit came upon you, but it did not come upon a hardened heart. You could not change yourself, but you decided to embrace change. And so the change came. You may not have the power to change, but you have the decision to permit that power to come. Is God speaking to us? Say it again. I decide. To break that barrier of poverty in my family and in my life. Say, I decide that I will be wealthy. I will be blessed. That wealth and riches will be in my house. A true decision must be set as a goal. What is a goal? A goal is an expectation. A goal is an expectation. A clearly defined expectation. Clearly defined expectation. That's a goal. 
the moment you, you set it as a goal to marry, if you are not in a relationship, what automatically? It's like your love mode is switched on. And suddenly you can see the difference between Rose and um, what's her name? Huh? Vicky. You can see the difference between what's her name? Ada and all these people. All of a sudden, if you have not decided to marry, you will see everybody as a sister in the Lord, a sister in the vineyard, and all of these kinds of evangelistic things. That dimension will never be activated until you decide. True or false? If you decide to be a competent musician or worship minister, you will begin to discern difference between what you are doing and what they are doing. Otherwise, if you come and you have a general sense, you can sing and go off key and be smiling. You don't even know you've gone off key because there is no passion in that area. You have not set it as a goal. Goals give us focus. It, it, it weeds away distractions in our lives. Man can only accomplish what he sets as a goal. So every other thing becomes secondary and you focus on that one thing until it is accomplished. Are you seeing now? So if you put it as a goal to be financially blessed, the devil tells you this is too carnal. How can you put money in front of you like this and say I'm putting it as a goal? Whereas you do not know that it's a goal that can be accomplished so that it will give you room to focus on more spiritual goals. Hallelujah. I only imagine the times that we will now begin to go on air, launch TV ministries, now start building structures and facilities for ourselves. These structures will cost hundreds of millions and billions of naira. If we ignore, thank God we are a ministry that is very unapologetic about the reality and the necessity of wealth in building the kingdom. And so we have irresponsible fathers. A woman gets up, she's pregnant, but she's going to go and fend for the family. And the man who got her pregnant sits down there guiltless. Right? And just living his life, hoping she will go and look for money and come back and cook. And the man will eat. And say, Kai, why? I, I thought we used to eat chicken. What has happened to the chicken? Now he did not contribute in any way. And he, there is no sense of apology. He's just waiting for her to give birth to that one and get her pregnant again. Without any sense, because he has not decided, he has not seen the relevance of finance in family building. Help us tonight, oh God. Is God speaking to us? Please, brothers and sisters, I want you to not in any way ignore what I'm telling you. It won't do me any harm because I've made my decision. What I'm doing to you right now is my contribution to stop your tears of the future. What I'm doing for you right now is my contribution to help you break that jinx of poverty once and for all. So that you can enjoy the abundance that God has prepared for you. The first way to be wealthy is to decide to set it as a goal. You must set it as a goal. There is nothing in life that you will accomplish if you do not set it as a goal. You set your degree as a goal. And no matter what it is, your mind is on it. The day you hold your certificate, mission accomplished. You get another goal. You cannot put finances as one of those things and vaguely just say, yes, yes, we'll look at it by God's grace. When I start working, I'll plan around my finances. Let me tell you, that disrespect, that dishonor for wealth will cost you more than you can bargain for. I watched my family. I've told you my story again and again. I came from a very good Christian family. Never been all these boys that go around doing all kinds of things. I don't have all those necessary, all those kinds of very funny pasts. But one thing that I saw, both of my parents, they have, they have retired now, but then both of them worked. They started working early. My father started working at 26 years. Brothers and sisters. And he's never lost a job. 
But in his old age, I saw that man suffer. I said, well, what is the meaning of this? There are many of us right now. You sit down and you watch your father and you watch the tears out of his eyes. Because nothing can be done about the situation. Your father will go and ask you to borrow 2,000 naira from a neighbor. Somebody who was once a small boy pushing Geregere around your street. Now he has become blessed. And your father will say, please tell him, Baba said you should give 2,000. You be the one to go and collect it. You feel guilty. He goes strong a thousand times as he counts two thousand and gives you. You go and give your father. You buy something and he returns the change. The lunch and the dinner of that family is dependent on that two thousand. And everybody eats and goes back. And all you do in the night is to cry. Crying does not produce change. It may comfort you emotionally, but you must set it as a goal. I can remember the day in my life I vowed before God that me and poverty, we have drawn the line. It was a decision. I made up my mind that whatever it would cost me under God to explore what it would take to get out of this thing. I never want to look at my children one day and see that I cannot afford to pay school fees for them or I cannot afford to bless them. There are so many people Imagine, brothers and sisters, that you came for Koinonia and you saw that there were no chairs everywhere sparked. And we say, brethren, um, there is a serious financial situation here right now. Everybody, can you contribute whatever you can bring? We need to buy fuel. We need one jerry can of fuel as a matter of life and death. Oh, apostle has not eaten. If you really want to hear anything sensible this night, please, let's rally round and rush and see how we can come to the rescue. You laugh about it and you trivialize it today. May God give you grace to start a ministry and you will respect what I'm saying. You will see how that you can pray and tongues won't come out because you cannot see where the finances will come out. And you stop. You will know when you stop. The load on your head is not demons. You are hearing voices. You are seeing things. That's what makes many of our fathers to be. They didn't start like that. At 40, he's talking to himself. Right? He sees you and calls you by the name of your elder brother. You think it's his fault? Something happened. A load that would have been lifted and thrown away was permitted to sit on his head for a long time. And that's the result. And many of us, as young as we are, that load is already coming shortly. You found out that you used to be kind and nice. Now at 27, see how angry you are at everybody. Welcome. The load is landing. It's like a lift. By the time you are 31, you hate everybody around you. 40, you hate your wife. 45, you hate your children. 50, you hate yourself. See that? Number two. There is an exact formula for wealth and abundance. That is for next week. Next week I'm going to be teaching you the formula for wealth. But right now, allow me to be a surgeon as we do a little x-ray just for a few minutes on our minds to help us. For the formula, we'll talk about that. The first way to be wealthy is the decision to be wealthy. Second is to know that there is an exact formula for wealth and abundance. Three, the mental transition that brings wealth. You must understand the mental transition that brings wealth. The mental transition that brings wealth. Guys, come and help me. I think these things are gone. Let's push it forward. Let me have three people here, please. Everybody watch what I'm about to demonstrate. Never forget this for the rest of your life. One here, one here, one here, quickly. I classify people into three in terms of mindset and transitions. Everybody watch please. You will see yourself right now. There are three types of people based on mindset versus their physical realities. Generally speaking, listen. Generally speaking, there is a law. And this is the law. That your physical condition, 
your physical condition today, today, whether you believe it or not, is a reflection of your ideology so far. Your physical condition today is a reflection of your thinking of yesterday. Are you getting me? Your physical condition tomorrow will be a reflection of what you are thinking right now. Your thought process, your mindset, the content of your ideologies. A direct, exact reflection of your thought life and the quality of your mindset. The level of ministry that we are enjoying right now is a direct reflection of what our mindset and understanding about ministry has been. If we never upgrade, this is the level we remain forever. But if we upgrade, then we rise. Your music ministry, your life, whatever it is that is happening in your life, I'm telling you right now, is a messless reflection of your mindset and your ideology. Let's have that in mind. So, I look at my life today and all that I see is a reflection of the way I have thought about God about success, about people, about ministry, about life. There are three people. Watch this. The first type of people that we have are those who have poor mindsets and poor physical realities. Write it. A poor mindset dash poor physical reality. That's the first kind. I'm giving you a classification of people now in terms of wealth. This guy, in this example now, has a poisonous mindset about wealth. This is the guy that sleeps under the bridge. This is the guy that smokes around. This is the guy that believes that cheating and looting is the way forward. This is the guy angry with his uncle. This is the guy angry with God. This is a guy angry with government, angry with his boss in office. There is a mindset that he has and there is nothing in his life. He's living a beggarly life. He's living a poor life. And he has a lot of contemporaries who are like him. Are you getting my teaching now? All his contemporaries think like him. They think like him. So they all discuss. You hear them say things like, Kai, one day go better. That's the mindset. Poor mentality. They are the ones who borrow to do everything. They borrow to eat. They borrow to buy clothes. They borrow to buy phones. They do everything. Borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. And they live perpetually in the course of death. This is the person. I won't go back. I can't go back. To the way it used to be. Before your presence came and changed me I won't go back, can't go back To the way it used to be Before your presence came and changed me This guy is blaming the witches in his village As the reason why he's poor He's blaming his grandfather that cannot walk. And he's saying the way he looked at me when I went to the village. The way his eyes was, that's why I'm poor. Are you seeing that? This guy is blaming his class of degree to why he's poor. This guy is angry with everybody. He wants to change. He hates rich people. He hates blessed people. He gossips about them. He resents them. And he's hoping to be like them. Paradox. Could that be you? Could this be you I'm describing right now? I know you are praying in tongues, but could that be you? That right now, the reason why your life has not changed, the reason why your pocket is empty, listen, the biggest difference between the rich and the poor is not money in their pocket. Money in their pocket is a, is a reflection of something going right. Money in their pocket is a sign that they have gotten something right. The money in their pocket, their financial abundance is their receipt in the school of wealth. It's a sign that they have purchased something true. 
Are you getting what I'm saying? Unfortunately, we concentrate on changing our physical reality. This guy, this guy is trekking from pillar to post. This guy is living under a place where there is no roof, maybe an uncompleted building. This guy has been rejected by his family. This guy wants change. He cries every night. Oh God of heaven, will you not wipe my tears? But nothing changes. God seems to be infinitely silent about his situation because he does not know that before he prayed, the prayer had been long answered. God will not answer the same prayer twice. The reason why you hear him silent may be that he answered it before you called. It's only that we have not been trained to know how and when God answers prayers. Is God speaking to us, please? So, this is it. This guy does everything. Listen, his mindset is poor. So, everything in his life is a reflection of it. Give this guy one million naira. Something here will destroy the money. Are you getting what I'm saying? Give him a job in Shell. Something here will eat up the resources. Let his titan open doors for favor. Give him 10 million naira. Let him even win a lottery. Something here will frustrate what is in his physical reality. Are you getting what I'm saying? Dash him a house. Dash him a house. Something about his indecision. He will be under pressure and he will sell the house. And use the money to eat it. Armed robbers will kill him. He will run his mouth to the wrong people. They will beat him and collect the remaining money. And the guy will say, I remember. This house was my own. Now they've renovated it. It was his own. No matter what you do to help this man, you waste your time. It's like pouring water in a basket. Hear me. If you really want to help poor people, you don't help them by giving them money. That's why I feel sad. I believe in charity, oh. But the solution to empowering people is not carrying bags of rice and floating around and snapping in front of um, bags of beans and sewing machines and, 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 and uh, uh, opening saloons and so on and so forth. You don't change people like that. All that rendezvous of giving people money, I dash you 20,000, I dash you 50,000, and the person comes and says, praise the Lord, I was nobody, but see now, they gave me 200,000. Is that what will make you somebody? There is an error. Is someone getting what I'm saying? Now, when this guy sees a wealthy man, this is what he says, if only I was in his condition. The only thing is that my father is a stupid man. When his friends were taking steps, he didn't take, he was drinking. Now he got born again too late. He got born again when he finished the whole money. And he thinks that's the reason. That's the only difference. And so he sees somebody counting money. He's about to buy a car. And he pays cash. And this guy looks and admires him and says, Hi! Life. Thinking that the difference between him and the rich man is just the money in their pocket. Oh, how wrong. How wrong. He thinks the man is rich because he's doing business. And he said, ah, ah, but this guy is rich. He said, no, be businessman. He's a businessman. Go and do it. If all there is to wealth is business. Go and do it. There is still demand for more of that line of business he's doing. So go and do it. If you think all there is to wealth is business. Are you seeing the balance now that I'm giving many of us? Because all through, there are many of us, the moment they talk about finance, you just suit up and you just think CEO. <laughs> Calm down. It's not CEO. It's right here. Your mindset. Everybody say my mindset. My understanding. God wants to step into his life and change his story. But they limited the Holy One. His mindset. He has not made the decision to be blessed. He does not care. He only wants things to change. This man does not want to take responsibility for his destiny. All he wants is let friends, in-laws, cousins give him money. And now, as a result of that frustration, the day his daughter starts going out with an unbeliever, so long as he's getting money, he does not mind. Let her go to hell so that I will get money. It doesn't matter. Many in the body of Christ are here. Favor, when it comes to this life, 
is like one million times zero. Because favor comes to hit a rock. So God has been sending in favor to this man. When he does calculation of all the monies and the opportunities that has come. This man, because of his mindset, he does not know the law of honor. And so all the destiny helpers that come into his life, he throws them away. Because his mindset is destroying him. Is God speaking to us? I'm not just talking about money. He meets a rich man. Has access to that man for two weeks. And he's there licking his mouth. Waiting for the last day when the man will leave. So that he will count 50,000. Because his mindset does not teach him. That until here is changed. Your hand cannot change. That's why the first dimension of the anointing for wealth. Hear me. Is not to give you money. Thou anointed my head with oil. There is a reason why it's your head is it starts with first. Thou anointest my head with oil. Something must happen to your head for your cup to run over. Why didn't you say thou anointed my hand? I thought you hold cup with your hand. Thou anointed my head. There is an anointing that needs to do something here for my cup to start running over. My cup is at the mercy. Of my head. So the Bible says, ye have an unction from the Holy One. He said, that anointing can teach you. That anointing can teach you. The anointing does not just give you power to gyrate around and say, I have the Esther anointing. Whether you have Deborah's anointing, Esther anointing, uh, Jennifer's anointing, it's not going to do anything. Brothers and sisters, the transition. Something about his mindset Resisting God and is resisting money. Here he's waiting for God to come and change his life. I will wait till my change comes. He doesn't know what he's saying. No. He thinks he knows. I will wait. He justifies that the reason why he's here is because God wants him to be here. Whereas that is the wealthy place. Are you getting me? Now, watch the transition. The first mindset is what? Poor mindset, poor physical reality. Nothing in him is changing. Watch this. The moment this guy, watch this please, everybody, just look up before you write. The moment this guy decides that I am tired of my life, I'm tired of the status quo, there's got to be more than this. Come on now, you, you, you step home and immediately you get home, you see your mother crying. You see your father crying and you say enough is enough. That's a decision. That, that's a defining moment. For desperate people do desperate things and we press in need. There's gotta be more, gotta be more. There's gotta be more than this. You are here praying in tongues, fasting, a prostitute sleeps with somebody overnight. Brothers and sisters, a woman who is going to hell and the next day she wakes up a millionaire and here is somebody praying and fasting in tongues and the heavens are closed. Is God that wicked? Is that the God they taught you? Something is wrong. We're tired of the status quo. There's got to be more than this. For many years in my life, let me tell you, I cried and cried to the God of heaven. I said, Lord, you've got to change my situation. But this is where I was standing. I've loved God all my life. I've served God all my life. I've given my entire life to God. But nothing changed in my life. I saw myself rising spiritually. People liked me. The hand and the anointing of the Spirit was strong upon my life. But this financial mountain refused to move. I fasted for days. Dry fasting. All kinds of fasting. I prayed. Nothing changed. The first book that would begin to give me an idea that there was something wrong I was doing in my life was Discovering Your Purpose by my small group. It was not a book of finances. But it, it planted a seed and I said, something is wrong. Something is wrong. I, listen, it takes humility to break out of poverty. If you are there arrogantly explaining yourself, the Bible says creation is waiting for the manifestation, not the explanation. 
I, I remember that night when I cried to the Lord of heaven. I said, Lord, you've got to do something about my life. You have shown me visions of my assignment. I'm not confused about my assignment. I cried to God. I cried to God. And that was when I made up my mind. The Spirit of God never spoke anything to me in terms of, Oh, thou my son, stand up, wipe your tears. God didn't say anything. The only word that God spoke to me was, Ask for the ancient paths. Right? Ask for the ancient paths. That's what the Spirit of God told me. Ask for the ancient paths. And he stopped there. I said, God, what is the meaning of this? That's not the kind of solution. Because you can imagine, with my mind, all I was thinking about was money to succor the current hunger first. Before we even talk of destiny. Destiny is, you know, when you are alive. Ask for the ancient paths. That's what the Holy Spirit told me. He didn't say, ask for the future paths. The revelation of that was, son, why do you want to discover what has been found? Why are you asking me to answer a prayer I answered before you were born? My silence is because I do not answer the same prayer twice. It's against the law of my majesty. Once have I spoken, it's you that will hear twice. And I made up my mind. I began to search the word. And I fell into... The teachings of Bishop David Oyedeko. May God bless him. May God honor him in life and in death. It began to revolutionize my mind. I said, wow. I never knew. I was never taught tithing. I was never taught this. I began to explore from there. The materials of Kenneth Aging. I started reading a lot of this. I bought tons and tons of business books. I read any and everything that had to do with finances. And the moment I started doing that, I couldn't make sense out of what I was reading. The only thing I knew was that I was the one who was responsible for where I was. I remember standing that night and saying, Lord, I take responsibility. I stop blaming people. I stop hating people. I make up my mind. Today, I know what I did. This was it. A transition. Are you getting what I'm saying? The transition from a poor mindset and a poor physical reality does not start by changing your physical reality. It starts by the decision for your mindset to change. Like many of you, many of you are this man standing right now. Something needs to change. And if any prayer would be prayed this night is that the anointing of the Spirit will come upon you so that your cup will run over. Now watch this. This guy here, he's sitting like you right now, listening to me teach. And all of a sudden, he makes up his mind. I'm tired of where I am. Watch this. I am ready for change. Do you know the first thing that will happen? That decision, that decision will experience a war in his mind. Look up, look up everybody. Something in him will reject the decision he's trying to make. The old man the old wine skin is fighting something about to come. The moment you make a decision, there will be war in your mind. Your old mentality will say, what are you doing? That's why they sang that song, I'm coming out of my comfort zone. Because it's the zone you are comfortable with. You have blamed government. Right now, this is what that decision will do to you. When you stand, other friends will come and say, Pastor Femi, Aluta, continue, let's keep struggling. And say, no. I've made a decision. The first mistake, or not mistake really, the first challenge you will start experiencing. Your friends will say, something about you is changing. You are not looking like us. Are you getting me? They will start fighting you. They will start making you feel that the decision you are taking is a foolish one. You too, you will see the mountain and say, when will I get there? But make the decision. Watch this. Sooner or later, a mindset, this transition is, is coming to Pastor Femi. Now, initially he would not wash his clothes. He would wear any dirty thing and live like that. But that mindset is already, something is shifting. 
He's sleeping under the bridge. He's wearing a dirty cloth. He's going to start washing his clothes now. The next time he appears with his clothes washed and ironed, his friends, something in his mind is now pushing him and saying, you don't belong here anymore. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He will start feeling it. This level starts pushing him away because the transition started. It will start with persecution. It will start with gossip. This is the pushing away. He's saying, we are secretly acknowledging that you are rising. We are trying to bring you down. But your determination is too great. So we persecute you out of this realm. We drive you out of this realm. Everybody sings the song. You just write every song and you are thinking, let me go and wax an album. And you hear a message about excellence and being world class. And you settle down and say, I'm packing up any project of album or anything. I'm not producing anything. I'm giving myself two years of intense rehearsal and training. All your friends say, are we ready to go to the studio? Say, sorry, I use the money to go and enroll in a music school. They will hate you. As you begin to learn about ad lipping, voice control, vocal discipline, what happens? A shift is happening. You are still here, but gradually something is moving you. The way you think, when they are gossiping, you are quiet. Very soon you find out that you can no longer connect with them. It's a sign that the plane has started lifting. A transition is happening. You are still poor, but something is changing. You are moving to this second person. This second person is a wealthy mentality, but a poor physical condition. Wealthy mentality. So now you have left the realm of a poor mindset, poor physical condition. You are now a wealthy mindset, but still a poor physical condition. This is the hardest part of the journey to wealth, where there is a paradox. There are two realms fighting within you. In your mind, you are already a rich man. You have read the books, but physically, nothing is showing yet. This is where many people give up. Because we beguile ourselves into thinking we are not making progress. You do not know that you have left here. Yes, when you talk to a rich man, you talk like him. You are already happy because your mindsets are similar. When you talk to a blessed man, he says you are smart. You are going far. But your physical reality is still poor. When you talk to a poor man, he hates what you are saying, but he can live with you. because your So you are in between the wealthy place and the place of poverty. And this is where great men fall. Because you are asking, Oh God, I've been praying. No, you are reading the books. You are hearing the seminars. You are still eating the same thing you were eating. But brother, you are changing. You are no longer where you used to be. This is where a few of us who have taken some decisions are. Here and there, things are already working. Little money comes in. One little breakthrough. People are already recognizing your paradigm. But the truth is you are still physically speaking. When they join you and this guy, there is no difference. But there is a difference. Is God speaking to us? I won't go back. I can't go back. To the way I used to be. Before your presence came and changed me. Hallelujah. Many of us are here right now. At this point, there is no physical cash to prove. The way you talk is a lonely path because the rich cannot come to you and the poor will run away from you. So you are alone. Mentally speaking, you are here. Physically speaking, you are here. Are you getting what I'm saying? And that shift is very constraining. You are still experiencing failures here and there. But people do not know that the change has happened. When they see you, they call you with what you used to be or what they know you as. There is no way you can prove to them you have left their realm. Don't be under pressure to prove any point. The system itself will prove the point. Have you ever been taught this? That you are learning? Have you been taught this? This was a revelation that the Holy Spirit gave me. I didn't read it in any book. I wrote it down as he was dictating it for me. The transitions. That it all starts right here. Pray and fast at this level. If you do not make a decision and allow the Holy Spirit to change your mind, 
you are moving nowhere, my brother. Get a job in NMPC at this level. Nothing significant will happen. I guarantee you in the name of the Lord. Right here. You do not have results. But here and there, there are consolations you are receiving. Watch this. At this point, when you continue doing what brought you from here to here, and add a few other things that I will be teaching us next week. What brought you from here to here is not the same thing that will take you from here to here. There are some things you will add to it from here that will take you to the wealthy place. And so it says, Thou hast caused men to ride upon our heads. We walk through water and through fire, but thou broughtest us into a wealthy place. I announce to you that there is a wealthy place. There is a place that is beyond your place of birth. There is a place that is beyond suffering and financial hardship. Many are unwilling to pay the price. Watch this. Many people in this area try to dress like that man to prove that they are there. But their mindset betrays them. They try to buy his kind of house and it strangles them. They try to take their children to his children's school and it strangles them. Many in this place some of you here are giving people an impression you are there, whereas this is where you are. There must come a time in every man's life where you must take responsibility and humble yourself and stop lying. If you are not a millionaire, you are not. If you show me one million naira, I'm not interested because it's as deceitful as a piece of paper. Your mindset will prove to me whether you can show me that next year or that will be the last time you will show me one million naira. Never get impressed when somebody shows you a car or a house. Let him show you his mindset. And then you will know whether he can preserve what he has carried. I can dash you money. I can dash you a mindset. I can dash you house. Favor comes. But the benefits of favor is built through wisdom. The Bible says through wisdom, not through prayer. Not through favor. Favor brings the blessings. Lack of wisdom drives it away. Favor brings the rain. Your mindset is like a basket. You keep it outside and all through the rainy season you lift it up. And the only thing you have is a wet basket. A fortress, but not the reality. My altar is calling you, oh God. My sacrifice is calling you. Oh God, my pain is calling you. Oh God, my decision is calling you. Oh God, my seriousness is calling you. Oh God, take my prayer. Oh God, take my praise. Oh God, take my praise. Take my praise. It's calling you. Take my praise. Take my praise. It's calling you. I look at my life today and I am humbled. I was shedding tears this afternoon. As I turned back to look at where God has brought me from. And I said, God, you are faithful. And God said, no, I'm not just faithful. You too, you are faithful. It was our faithfulness together. I know that sounds very religious. But it took my embracing his faithfulness to take advantage of it. I will never be poor again for the rest of my life till Jesus comes. It's not a confession. It's not something I'm trying to claim. I signed out honorably never to return to that realm again. No matter what happens to the economy of Nigeria, there's no returning again. You can make that decision. It starts with a decision, not a wishing. Not say, ah, it's better for some people. No. Never ever. There was a time in this ministry, Pastor Jake is here. The first time we were going for our crusade, brothers and sisters, 
believers came together and raised money. We did not have money to pay the hotel. The hotel where we would lodge. We saw all kinds of miracles on the crusade ground. But it did not change our financial status. Let me tell you. I was almost being locked in the prison. Because the sound people, we could not pay them. How much? 150000 I will never forget. I lay down in frustration. I remember one of my friends in frustration signed a check of 90000 for me. I was so happy. I gave the sound people. They went to the bank and the check bounced. And they returned back in anger and they said, look, we are coming to arrest you. I said, Lord, if they arrest me, it's for the gospel. My altar is calling you, oh God. My sacrifice is calling you. I was in community market, your core market. Your core market. I've eaten there. I know that I don't know how it is now, but I know that place very well. Where you buy food and you don't order pure water. Pure water was a luxury. What for? When there is water in that jar. You order garial soup and 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 and, and, and no meat. Thirty naira exactly. I remember telling the woman, please don't embarrass me here. This is what I have. I didn't ask for meat. As you are laughing, I hope you are seeing the seriousness in what I'm communicating. This ministry will never be poor forever till Jesus comes. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word. And I will forever see your grace. Your spirit opens to me the treasures of your word and I will forever sing your praise I will sing I will sing of the wonders of your word I will sing out for joy I will Of the wonders of your word, and I will forever sing your praise. Listen, when God opens your eyes and gives you the key, you come into a realm of dominion. I don't care what is happening in your life right now. Let me tell you something I submit to you with all humility. I know what it means to be poor, and I know what it means to be blessed. I can show you how to get there. I may not boast to know all, but I can show you something that can take you out of where you are. Next week, I'm going to be sharing with us the formula. In the last one year of my life, I have learned more. In fact, let me tell you, compared to the things I learned in the last one year, I looked at myself, I said, Joshua, tell me. What, what have you... I have spoken in, 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 in financial conferences. I have spoken in business meetings. But the thing that the Lord opened my eyes to, and God connected me to uncommon mentors. Uncommon mentors. Some dead, some alive. Uncommon mentors whose words are like the words of God. When you watch a master do something, the proof of mastery is ease. You will tear down the mysticism. Hallelujah. This is where many of us are. You are under pressure to do business because you think it will hurriedly take you to the wealthy place. Calm down. You notice we have not mentioned business. We have not even mentioned money many times. We are talking of mindset. There is a surgery God is doing. And right here, brothers and sisters, is your dream come true? Right here is mission accomplished. Right here is the realm where you do not think about money again. 
Right here is the realm where you can serve God with peace of mind. Right here, the name is the wealthy place. The place where few have come is a place of rest. You enter your financial Sabbath. Right here is the place where high blood pressure will not kill you again. Right here is the place where no matter the stress of your village people or you financially, it will be inconsequential. Right here is the place where you will serve God and fund your assignment and do that which God has called you to do in peace. It's called the wealthy place. This is God's destiny. This is God's desire to transit you. And my job in this series is to attempt with the cooperation of your seriousness and your diligence to show you the path that transits you from there to here. Because there is a wealthy place. There is no fear here. Because you did not get your wealth by crooks and pranks. Now you will understand the definition of my, the, my definition of financial prosperity. Not just the ability to have abundance but the ability to be able to replenish, to multiply, and to sustain its availability. At this point, you have the keys. Hallelujah. Right there where you are seated looking at me, has anything I've said tonight made any kind of sense to you? That there is need for you to live where you are. Every one of us is one of these three. Most of us, very few if at all, are here. For the most part, those who have paid attention significantly to their finances are right here. And many people right here in Koinonia and in the world are here. They have come here, they are lying down there with no hope of rising. Yet, in their minds, they are deceitfully convincing themselves that one day it will go better. They are hoping that the day their grandmother dies, there will be a sudden transition. They are hoping that the day their enemy somewhere falls down and dies, there will be a transition immediately. If you are in that category, let me announce to you before time, save yourself. Hard shattering disappointment and embrace the pathway that vetoes any covenant and any ancestry that vetoes any yoke, any spell I don't care who is invoking what, there are two ways to bind Satan one is by prayer, the other is by knowledge your obedience itself will judge every disobedience Write this down. The major difference between the poor and the rich is their decision to prosper, comma, their mindsets, comma, the major difference between the poor, the rich and the poor is their decision to prosper, Comma, their mindset, their mental conditioning, comma, and their comprehension of the true formula for wealth and abundance. I'm going to be teaching you that next. I will show you in plain terms the shocking formula that is responsible every single millionaire and billionaire you see, except it's a crook. But anybody through the dignity of kingdom integrity who has risen, you will see it stare at you at the face. I tell you next week, some of you will shed tears like this because you will say, my goodness, my goodness, is this it? Hallelujah. Your mindset. I'd like you to say in the name of Jesus, my mentality must change in the name of Jesus I allow my mindset
to be changed. In the name of Jesus, I allow the power of God and the mind of Christ to superimpose my mindset. In the name of Jesus, I declare that I'm on my way unstoppably to the wealthy place. Say one more time, I'm on my way to the wealthy place. In the name of Jesus, I make a decision that I will never stay poor. I make up my mind. Let this be the first step tonight into the wealthy place. Rise up on your feet. I will sing of the wonders of your word. I will sing out for joy. I will sing of the wonders of your word. And I will forever sing your praise. Hallelujah. Lift your voice and begin to thank God for the teaching tonight. There is a place called the wealthy place. There is a realm of wealth and abundance. There is a mindset that has kept Africa in poverty. There is a mindset that has kept Nigeria in poverty. There is a mindset that has kept the church in poverty. There is a mindset that has kept your family. and thank you for this teaching. It is the entrance of God's word that gives light and understanding unto the simple. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now we're going to take three prayer points very quickly. Prayer point number one. I'd like you to say, Lord, baptize me with an anointing that will make me serious about my finances. Lift your voice and pray. Kill every unseriousness. You've never paid attention to it. You are heading the path of destruction, I tell you. If you have just spiritualized it and left it there, you are headed for the path of disappointment. Pray. Baptize me, O God, with a supernatural grace to take my finances seriously, knowing that my assignment will suffer without it, my comfort in life will suffer without it, the advancement of your kingdom will suffer without it. Ladies, are you praying? Don't say my husband will bail me out. Pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now pray and say, Lord, I have decided and there is no going back. I have decided. May I not just be emotional now and then throw it back. I've decided. I've decided. Lift your voice and pray. Announce it. Let the devil hear you. I have decided to embrace the path of the flesh. I have decided consciously, willingly. I will never remain poor. No, it must change. No, it must change. Where my father did not cross. Where my mother did not cross. Oh, I'm on my way. I'm on my way. I may not look like it now. But I'm on my way. I submit to the discipline. I submit to the training. I submit to the discipline. It may cost me my comfort zone. 
it may cost me my ego but I'm ready for change pray pray God will honor your prayer it's a decision that will bless you it's a decision that will determine the way the next phase of your life will be you may not do anything about yesterday yesterday is gone yesterday is gone stop regretting the past stop regretting the failure stop regretting the disappointment stop regretting the lack make the decision now make the decision now you may not know what to do you may not know how to go about it just make the decision hallelujah hallelujah between this man this man and this man you know where you truly are don't lie to yourself many of us are here i like you to pray and say lord the mental transition that must happen for me to leave this realm to this realm to this realm i'm ready and i submit to it go ahead and pray 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 i submit oh god not to money not to business but to the mental transition now i know that it's not just about cash it's not just about business it's not just about investment it's not just about a job it's not just about access to wealth a mental transition pray no power will stop me i'm determined to shift Are you praying, Koinonia? Lord, I will see. Lord, I partake. favoritism with God every single one of us who is interested can and should enter the wealthy place God is giving everyone an open check if you do not enter many of our parents if they had the opportunity to be mentored and taught if they had the opportunity to receive that mental transition they would have been billionaires right now You have an opportunity many long for and never receive. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
pick up your notebook, I want to give you an assignment. I want you to write exactly without any ambiguity. You must not do it now. Write exactly what financial freedom means to you. At what point in your life be as clear about it? What does it mean for you? At least let's use this level. Not forever. Let's just use the level that brings you into prayer. How much resource coming into you and how frequent will it amount to financial freedom to you? Right? What kind of abundant supply will need to come into your life? Don't be myopic and at the same time don't be childish. Don't get up and write 10 billion naira per week. That's nonsense. You don't need that level of wealth now. You never think if you do not make it a goal. You never, hear me, learn this today. Anything you want to accomplish in life, you must set, separate it out. Decide on achieving it and make it a goal. And you will see the power of God coming. Business people call it the power of the universe. They do not know that all power belongs to God. Are you getting what I'm Just do what I'm telling you to do. Be childlike about it. Don't argue and say, I know I've read ABC business book. Just be childish and do what I'm telling you to do. Write it down. Number two, write down three things that financial abundance will do to you and your family. Right now. Knowing the situation of your life and your family. I don't care whether you come from a rich family or not. Write three things under God. I could give you a little expo. It will give you comfort. It will fund your assignment. And it will fund the advancement of God's kingdom. Three things. That's the presence of fine. If you were seated here right now. And you had access to to cash relatively unlimited imagine all the things you have wanted to do for people you are not that greedy it's because there is no money you are not that self-centered you are not that materialistic that craving is because of lack and poverty that sense of materialism is because you've never had enough there's almost i have apples all the time in my fridge I like apples and I have apples all the time. I remember when they used to buy apples. Sometimes they would buy apples and they'll cut one into four. Did that happen to you? And you stand impatiently hoping for your turn to come. I thought I really was in love with apples. There are many foods. In fact, there was a name my father used to call me. I thought I liked food. It wasn't that I liked food. Every time you know you will miss a thing, you want it as a matter of life and death. But when God brings you to a position where you are in control of the supply, that's when you will see your true state. Many of you don't know who you really are. Poverty has turned you into whatever. You chase any man that comes around. You are not that cheap. It's because of poverty. If you solve it, you will see the stability in your life. Some of you, as you are like, like this, if you pass and somebody corners you and tells you there's 14119 around, you just smile and say, there are people that when you see them, you know they are dubious from their eyes. They can participate in anything. If you want to hide something, just call them. They know how to do it for you. All that petty life you see is because it's not, we should not be blaming people and be calling them fraud 419. Have you taught them the way? People are so desperate. If you don't teach them, they will do anything and everything. Why go into prostitution when there is a pathway in the dignity of kingdom integrity? Why go into impatience and arm robbery and fraud and all of this when there is a pathway with decency 
the dignity of kingdom integrity. The last prayer point. I'd like you to pray and say, Lord, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, walk on my mind again. Walk on my mind. Walk on my mind. Walk on my mind. Pray. That's the limit, brothers. That's the limit, sisters. That's the limit. Man of God, that's the key to the next level. Businessman, that's the key. Let's cry to God. Walk on my mind. I'm going to be teaching us the components of a wealthy mindset. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just kill out one minute and pray. Can you passionately pray for your loved ones and, and, and say, Lord, I vow that if you show me this key, I will reveal it to my loved ones and the people. There are so many people that need to get out of this. Go ahead and pray. Lord, I will extend the hand of mercy. My family members are willing to learn. My wife is willing to learn. My husband is willing to learn. My children are willing to learn. My business contemporaries are willing to learn. They just don't know the path. Show me, oh God, and let me be a, an agent that will advocate this mental transition. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Let me pray for you. Father, in the name